I'm Paul McKinney. I work with IBM on the Linux Technology Center. And this is a discussion of some work that uh, those guys and myself uh, have been doing over a period of almost two years now. In fact, yeah, uh, a few weeks short of two years. Uh, I thought we'd get done in August of 2015, so uh, let that be a lesson to you for those of you who have illusions of project planning. Anyway, so we'll talk about uh, why it took so long. Um, just who, uh, we'll get into who the people are in a little bit here. Let's see. If, there we go. Um, if we get through all of this, uh, what is a how many people have heard of a memory model? Okay, we got. Oh, wow. Okay, and by memory model, I mean like in parallel processing between CPUs and caches, as opposed to um, uh, something with virtual memory or something like that. All right. Um, um, so we'll we'll go from through there. And uh, so why would anybody care? All right, well this is, this is an example. This is sort of kind of what a uh, litmus test looks like. And the idea of this is we have a tool that you can feed things look kind of like that to. And you can give it a logic expression at the end. This funny slash backslash is supposed to be and. Uh, somebody <laughs> thought it was cute. Um, uh, but there you are, they're, they're math students, what did I say? Uh, and then so the question is, uh, if you have a uh, several variables, you've got three of them, x0, x1, and x2. Everybody's writing one to them, and then they're reading the next guy's variable. So this guy reads x0, writes x1. This guy writes x1, reads x2. This guy writes x2 and reads x0 in a circle. And the question is, can all these reads return 0? And that should be a 2 there, I'm sorry, but uh, you get the idea. Um, is it possible for everybody to do the right and then read the next variable over and have all of the reads come back zero? Let's, let's take a quick poll here. How many people think that is possible? It could happen. Okay, we got a few. How many people think that it shouldn't happen, but it might? All right. <laughs> How many people think that if any, any system that did that would be absolutely broken and it should be trashed? All right, yeah. Okay, we got a good spread there. That's uh, <laughs> some good opinions there. Yeah. Always like to see that. Okay, and it turns out that um, on any real system, um, including, uh, you know, people call x86 strongly ordered, they call the Ebbing mainframe strongly ordered, they call Spark. Well, those guys can do this, right? Because on most CPUs, almost all of them, all the ones that are popular in current production, an early write can slide behind a later read as long as they're reading different variables, dealing with different variables, which these are. So we're x0, we're doing there, we do x1, they can flip them. And after we flip them, it's going to look like that. And clearly, if the reads happen first, they all come back zero, right? So this really can happen. Um, and uh, so you see some of the need for a tool like this. And it's, you know, I'm not going to put you down. That's totally natural. You know, 20, 30 years ago, I would have had similar objections, felt the same way about, you know, what? This is garbage, right? But that's the way there, there's, you can make a computer not do that. It's just be kind of slow. And people don't like slow computers much. So uh, what we're doing here, there's a, and there's a bunch of other tricks that computers can play on you. This is just any, one example. And so the idea is to have a tool that you can feed kernel code to, C code, kind of like that, small. It has to be pretty small. And have it tell you everything that could possibly happen. And this can be helpful if you're trying to make sure you design your concurrent Go ahead, grab a chair. There's a bunch of them in here. Just wait on through. Quick, before I get data away. All right. So um, suppose we do something like this. Uh, so we have a, a store release and a load acquire. How many people have heard of what a store release is as opposed to a store? Or a load acquire as opposed to a load? OK, I suppose I should uh, talk about a little bit about them. What happens here, this isn't just a store, it's a store release. And what that means is it does the store and makes sure that you see the store under certain conditions, that you'll also see everything that happened before the store. Similarly, if you do a load acquire um, and you load something, then anything after the acquire will see the thing that happened before the store release. They kind of pair together that way. It's not, I, I'm being a little bit simplistic there, but the idea is if you have a store release and a load acquire, those form kind of a distributed ordering fence. So the stuff after load acquire, we'll see everything before the store release. And then uh, this is a memory barrier. It's a full memory barrier in Linux kernel. 
And the idea is, is that uh, if you have ordered things in another CPU that are playing with this, they will see that the write happened before the read. If the, obviously the other CPU didn't order something, then it could rearrange things and you might or might not see order. Okay. And uh, so the question is, if you, if you put those ordering things in, can it happen? Okay, and th these are the kinds of questions that the memory model is, is trying to answer, and there's just a huge variety of those things. Trying to memorize them all, you know, it's, it's a combinatorial problem. There's, you could have several different primitives in different places. You multiply the number of, by the number of variables, the number of processes, you know, with a huge number. So what we'd like to do, several things we want this thing to do. Uh, clearly, you could use it for a concurrent code design aid. The idea here is that unlike, there have been tools like this before. I've talked about them before. But they've been tied to a specific CPU. All right? And this is not tied to specific CPU. Instead, it's supposed to. It probably doesn't quite yet. But it's supposed to uh, be the intersection of all the guarantees of all the CPUs. So if you do something with this tool and it says, hey, that can't happen, what that means is it can't happen on alpha. It can't happen on ARM. It can't happen on PowerPC. It can't happen on x86. It can't happen on, there's like 30 of them. I don't know them all, but you get the idea. Uh, it also uh, looks like it's good for an education tool. Uh, we hope for, we'll have some porting things like that. Um, and uh, we hope it also be incorporated in other tooling. This is very much an in the small thing. I mean, you, you just have a few lines of code and it looks at it very detailed. It does exhaustive, exhaustive state safe search, essentially. Not quite, but that's essentially what you get. On the other hand, if you tried dumping the whole kernel through here, um, nothing useful would happen. You would, you would just use all CPU and all memory available and then they get stuck. So, limited code size, and it also has limited types of operations. Um, We've got a reasonable set at this point, uh, uh, and uh, some of the ones we don't have, for example, we don't have locks yet, we're working on that, but we have an atomic exchange operation with which you can build a locking printer. All right, so that's kind of what we're trying to do. And uh, how many people have heard of something called memorybarriers.txt before this talk? Uh, as a text file in the, yeah, okay, a few people. Uh, all right, so memorybarriers.txt is a documentation file of the Linux kernel source tree that defines what the ordering semantics of the operations of the Linux kernel are. It's English prose, and so the thing that tells you, do a store release, this happens, you have memory here, this happens, you, and so on. Um, it's incomplete. It never was designed to be a mathematical document. Instead, what happens is it's just kind of a, a record of what's happened. So uh, David Howells initial, initiated, I, uh, one of the maintainers, as is Peter Zilstra and Will Deacon. And what happens is somebody goes and looks at it and says, well, I want to do this because it'll work better. Can I do that? And we'll look at it and we'll say, no, that doesn't work. Do something else. And so if we're feeling good, it might even suggest something else to do. Uh, or we might say, huh, yeah, you actually could. Uh, maybe we say you could, but don't, please. Or maybe you could, and we modify memory barriers.txt to add that as a new use case. So it's not that memory variables.txt is complete, it's just sort of a record of the things people have wanted and the things that have worked. Okay, so um, it's not a mathematical thing. And that means that there's a lot of quarter cases that are unexplored, which is fine. If nobody wants to do it, why should we put the bother of documenting it? If they want it, they'll come talk to us. So it's an organic thing. Um, now the thing is, is that if you're gonna make a tool that gives answers to all the questions, uh, it has to operate on something mathematically complete, and that's not memory barriers.txt. I'm not going to go through all the guiding principles. I'll just uh, uh, touch on a couple of them. Uh, Linus Torvalds make it very clear. Um, uh, Gary pointed out that Linus hasn't yelled at me lately. My operating procedures, if Linus doesn't yell at me every so often, um, I'm not trying hard enough. But he did yell at me a couple of years ago, and as a result, uh, we prefer strength to weakness. If we, have a, if we have an arbitrary choice, we make the model stronger rather than weaker. Um, uh, the thing going against that is that we want simplicity as opposed to complexity. Uh, if, if we, if we, in other words, if, if we could make it stronger and make an order of magnitude difference in the complexity of the model, and the things that are stronger are things nobody cares about, why bother? But um, we actually have both a strong and a weak model because we want to give people the choice. Okay, and there's a bunch of other things we, we have as desired things, but uh, uh, let's go ahead. Um, so. Uh, 
2005 to present, uh, the, the CNC++ memory models, actually this is not the first kind of general multi-machine memory model. C++11 C++ and C11 were there first. The thing is though that these things aren't really adapted to the Linux kernel. Linux kernel was there, I mean it wasn't formally defined, but it was there and had definitions before C11 and C++11 came along. And I was not able to convince the committee they should do exactly what the Linux kernel did. Uh, there was some <clears throat> strong resistance to anything involving that in fact. About 2009, some researchers at uh, University of Cambridge and other associate universities started uh, formalizing uh, hardware memory models. And uh, there's a URL for, for that that gives a bunch of things in there. I think I presented earlier some of the essential little pieces of assembly language that have the same effect as this tool to work on assembly language before. About 2014, it was becoming really, really clear to me that memorybearers.txt was uh, uh, beyond its limits in terms of being able to actually support the kernel community with our needs and that we needed some kind of a tool. So uh, I started uh, talking to all these people that had done memory models before and say, hey, why don't you do it with the Linux kernel because we really need it and it'd be really cool and it'd be interesting to do and uh, uh, well, unfortunately there were three requirements. It had to handle legacy code and the Linux kernel has a bunch of code where there are shared variable axes that are just, that just like A equals 1, just like that or, you know, uh, some local variable equals X. And they went, yeah, yeah right. And then uh, we have a really wide range of SMP systems, and some of them are documented better than others, and some of them not much at all. And they're going, yeah, right, we got all this stuff, yeah, forget it. And then uh, the other thing is, if you take, you can, if you pull in a, a Linux kernel and look at the, the, you can take git log and do it just on memory barriers.txt, it's got a fair rate of change, okay? And so anything that's going to be like this, is, it's got to be a living thing. It can't just, you can't just produce a memory model tool and say, hey, here it is forever. No, it's going to have to change. As a result, um, yeah, I was asking people about this a lot and they were all saying, uh, sorry, forget it. Until early 2015, about two years ago. So every project has a founder. This project's founder is not me. Okay. Um, there's kind of a story behind this. I was uh, on the committee for a kid at Oxford getting a doctorate. Uh, that's why I was there. And because I was there, they, had, they set up meetings with a bunch of people, including a professor. Um, and the professor was from some other university, UCL, University College London. So I step into this guest office and there's this stack of paper, I notice. And this stack of paper has been red. I mean, it's dog-eared, it's folded, it's got coffee stains all over, it's got notes scrawled all over it in two different languages I could recognize. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I take a closer look and this thing is Linux kernel memory model. It's, it's memorymodel.txt which I thought was really cool because it was the first proof I had that somebody had actually read the thing front to back and actually tried to understand it. Um, well, not only that, but there was also a kind of a prototype tool that went with it. It was imperfect to say the least, but you could actually type some things in and get right answers sometimes. So there's our founder, Shad Olivef. Um, at the University of College London, she's still half time there. She's also uh, part time at Microsoft Research. So one question you might have, uh, I listed these three requirements and everybody was saying, yeah, we just can't do that. Uh, you might say, well, if they couldn't do it, why could she? And the answer is she used strategy. Now, a lot of people think that strategy is what you do, and it can be, but the most powerful strategies are when you choose not to do something, uh, which is what she did in this case. So she said, I'm sorry, this legacy code thing, forget it, we're not doing that, we're doing the other two. My first reaction was, well, that's kind of useless. But then when I thought about it a little bit, I realized, okay, um, if you as a maintainer or a developer have some code in the Linux kernel where you just say A equals 1, where A is a shared variable, it's on you to prove that the compiler can't mess you up. And if you can prove the compiler can't mess you up, what, you've, what you have to be able to do is show what the compiler can do, where it can rearrange things, and show that it's safe in all those cases. And what you've done in that case, you've essentially created a set of programs that have marked accesses in different places. And you can take those separate programs and separately run them through the tool. So it is useful, and if you mark your accesses, it's a lot easier to use. And the nice thing about that is, with that restriction, you can actually produce a solution. 
uh, and you don't have to model all compiler optimizations. And the hard part about mod modeling compiler optimizations is, that op is modeling the ones that haven't been written yet. That's the really hard part. All right. Okay, so um, uh, she had this model. She had in this language called CAT. Uh, uh, there's a, the paper on it is Herding Cats. Uh, yeah. Just <laughs> anyway, um, and uh, she recruited me because uh, well, she would notice that memorybearers.txt wasn't exactly the most mathematically rigorous document in the world, and she wanted some help filling in the pieces in it. And she also wanted to add RCU to this thing. RCU is read copy update. You can think of kind of like sort of read write lock, only very efficient on the read side. Uh, it's my baby inside the Linux kernel. And you know, this, that part sounded pretty easy. First thing, Jad actually knew something about RCU. She's been on the C++ standards committee. Uh, she, was, she was one of the people who did the work on the uh, C11, uh, doing, doing the proofs of correctness of the C11 memory model, and also uh, uh, a bunch, did a bunch of the work with Peter Sewell and Sosmet Sarkar on uh, formalizing power in R. So you know, she had a leg up on that. A paper uh, several of us wrote in 2012 uh, actually had some informal semantics. Plus, uh, uh, some other people produced a separation logic. Alexei Gotsman and a couple of guys did a separation logic expression of RC semantics in 2013. So, you know, what's, this should be easy. Let's have a show of hands. How many people in this room have heard of something called the Dunning Kruger effect? Yeah. Well, this was an illustration of that. So, the thing is, you know, I mentioned earlier that. Uh, memory text was kind of an organically grown thing that grew as people wanted to do something and it wasn't mathematically complete. And the same is true, was true of my understanding of RCU. There were things, you know, I understand the implementations really well, after all I maintain them, and there's a whole bunch of uses over 25 years that I understood really well. Um, but people use a rather small fraction of its capabilities and well sometimes with good reason but even if you have something stupid the tool still has to say what happens even if it is stupid right so uh, Jad used her normal approach she uses in interviewing hardware uh, architects to get memory model information so she sent me questions and these questions took the form of litmus tests so she sent me a bunch of litmus tests and separate files, a tarball of these things, and then there'd be a text file in there that would have the name of each file and yes or no. Is this, is this result allowed or isn't it? And when I say some, I mean like a couple hundred. <laughs> um, anyway, so I'd go through these things and uh, you know, fill them out and send them back, and I'd get the responses, uh, you know, there is no theory that allows this answer to be yes and this answer to be no. <laughs> And what would be happening, I mean, I'll just give one example of that, and that's this guy right here. Um, so the question is, can this happen? And remember, the whole thing executes, and then this is evaluated at the end of time, after all the dust is settled. And everything starts out at zero. So we got three processes, P0, P1, and P2. And uh, uh, the, you don't have to be an expert on RCU, but you do need to one thing. And that's if you do synchronize RCU, that's going to wait for any reset critical section, a reset critical section starts with RC read lock, ends with RC read unlock. If this reset critical section has already started, if it's in progress, when this thing starts, it'll wait for it to finish. On the other hand, here's another reset critical section. Suppose this one starts a little bit later. I mean, it starts before RC synchronized RC returns, but after it starts. Well, as long as it starts afterwards, it's not obliged to wait on it. So synchronized RC only has to wait for things that started before. Right? Um, kind of one of the stranger things in life is that semantic is actually useful. Uh, it turns out to be very useful. Um, basically what happens is it allows you to say, to, to change something, and then wait for anybody who might have seen the earlier state to get done. And then you can rely on everybody after that knows that the change has happened. And that turns out to be surprisingly useful. All right, so we've got the same circular thing. This guy reads y, he writes, 1 to x, this guy reads x, which if, if this is a 1, see it says r1 equals 1, r equals 1, that means that this happened before this. This guy writes to z, he writes a 1, and then if this guy reads z as 1, here we say r2 equals 1, um, excuse me, I'm in the wrong, r3 equals 1, here we are, and uh, then he's going to write 1 to z, to y, excuse me, and that would be right over here. So all of these three things come out 1, that means that somehow the writes happened before the reads in a circle, kind of. And the question is, can this happen? And uh, 
this caused me quite a bit of, this particular one and a bunch of other ones kind of like it, caused me quite a bit of uh, mental torture. Let's draw the, the circle in just to make it a little easier. So for this to happen, this right has to feed this read, this right has to feed this read, and this right has to feed this read, kind of in a circle. And again, uh, this guy's going to wait on the pre-existing RC retype critical sections. So, you know, I had to deal with this. You guys have to, too. So let's do a poll. we got four options. <laughs> <laughs> Option one, any system doing this should have been strangled at birth. <laughs> Option, I'll go through the options, then we can vote. Option two, reasonable systems really do this. Option three, there's just a great many unreal, unreasonable systems that really do this. And option four, a memory order is what I give to my hardware vendor. <laughs> How many of you for option one? Any system doing this should have been strangled at birth. All right. Yeah, we got a couple there. Three. All right. Good show. Number two, reasonable systems really do this. Okay, we got, yeah, I got a few. All right. Uh, three, there exists a great many unreasonable systems that really do this. Okay, got some there. How many people, well, this, this would have been me back in like the 80s. Yeah. Uh, memory order is what I give to my hardware vendor. <laughs> All right, yeah, that's it. You know, the thing is, no matter how you voted, there was a time I would have agreed with you. <laughs> yeah, what, uh, what Job would do is, if, if I finally got a determination, she'd put it as a comment in the limits test itself, which is helpful. And then the limits test comment says, Paul says allowed since mid-June, and that's June of 2015. So again, no matter why you voted, there was a time I agreed with you. Uh, the guys voting for number four was a long time ago, but still, there was a time. <laughs> um, and, and there were a lot of litmus tests like this. I mean, there were about 90% of the litmus tests were like, easy, you know, just, yeah, this is this. But the rest of them had some really strange thing like this that were, was hard for me to figure out. And this is how it can happen. It really can. Um, the thing is... Um, x86 doesn't allow this, but on weekly order systems, Itanium, ARM, Alpha, PowerPC, uh, MIPS, I think, these days, and several others, um, these guys are different variables. They have nothing to do with each other. There's nothing saying they have to be ordered. They can be switched. Okay? You do the right first. This can't be switched because we have synchronized RCU in there, which is an extremely heavyweight ordering operation. Um, and then over here, we can switch these again. Once we do that, well, this right can feed this read no problem. Synchronized RCU has to wait for this reset critical session because it's already going. It does not have to wait for this one because it started later. All right. So it waits for this guy to get done. In that time, this guy can uh, write, which then can be read by the tail end of this reset critical section. Then this right can feed the tail end of this reset critical section. But you don't have to take my word for it because we have a model now. And that's what the model says. And this is a bunch of stuff. This is all the states that have with R1, R2, and R3. It's a full set of eight of them. And down here, the summary, it sometimes can happen. There was one state out of, and that allowed it and seven that did not. So that really can happen, and it's a lot easier to type it in and feed it to the model and to beat your head against it for months like I did, okay? So I'm saving you quite a bit of time and effort this way. Okay, so... The thing was, is I was getting a little bit frustrated with myself. Uh, she actually calls her, the people she works with, the architects or myself, oracles. And I was feeling like a really low-grade oracle towards the end of summer 2015. Uh, so what I did was I just did a write-up of you know, what it can do and tried to expand and extend. And eventually, after looking at it and going through a bunch of examples, I came up with a general rule. Now, we had a cycle. We call it a cycle. And uh, you, you saw it with the arrows through there, going through there. If you have a cycle, and that cycle has at least as many grace periods, synchronized RCUs, as it does reset critical section, the cycle is prohibited. The example we had showed one grace period and two reset critical sections, therefore it was allowed. Now, John actually liked that she called it principled, which is about as good as it gets for a Linux kernel hacker, with one exception we'll see later. Uh, but she also said this was difficult to represent as a formal memory model. And by this time, by the time I actually got my act and did this, it was like September. And summer was over, she was a professor, and, you know, she was out of time. But she did designate a successor. Before we get to that, though, um, Jean actually produced the first demonstration that Linux kernel memory model was feasible, uh, despite a lot of people saying it wasn't. And she also forced me to a much better understanding of RCU, which may or may not be a good thing. I'll let you decide that. But on the first case, I, th I think I deserve a round of applause. I mean, that was pretty damn good. Anyway, uh, this is the guy she uh, has uh, as her successor, Luke Marangay. He's at Emory Paris. 
He joined in November uh, 20, 2015. Uh, he happened to, he was our major prof for a PhD, was how that put, fit together. Uh, this is Luke's first introduction to RCU. He's never heard of it before. And so I get to use litmus tests as a communication mechanism. Um, and so what I did was I handed him litmus tests that, and whether they're supposed to be uh, allowed or forbidden. Uh, one thing you could notice is that I actually have implementations of RCU, and in, it's not like there's a special RCU instruction in the hardware. I mean, I use memory accesses and locks and memory barriers and atomic operations. So you should be able to express RCU in terms of those operations, which I did. You can essentially write an, an RCU implementation in Lisa language, which is the low-level intermediate language that these tools use. Um, the thing is, it turns out to be hard to write one that's accurate. And so I had kind of a series of them that got more and more accurate, but most of them had some strange case where uh, platonic RCU, if you will, would give a different answer. Um, and some of these things, one weird thing about some of these things required that you, the more accurate ones, required that you make a decision up here on the value that was going to be loaded down here. And it turns out in, this, in these tools you can actually do that. Uh, they're called prophecy variables. <laughs> Well, what, what you do is, the thing is, you have the ability to throw executions away. So what you do is you just pick a random number. You can do that by having a store and an independent thread and just loading it. And then uh, you check at the end, and if the guess didn't match the actual thing, you throw the execution away. So sort of a Darwinian prophecy, if you will. <laughs> but it works. <laughs> anyway, so Luke is producing a series of real models. And the re you're running, well, if we can do this, why bother with a real model? One is that... Um, you have to have some really weird features. You, um, I won't go, anyway, I won't go into the weird features you need, but um, the other thing is that uh, if you have like a four thread example for RCU and you're doing the simulated thing, it's gonna take four hours to figure it out for the tool. Um, and it's less than a second using the mo modeling RCU. So it's much, much more efficient to have a formal model of it next to the model than to make it worry about all the little pieces. Okay, uh, one of the cool things about Luke, he's a theoretician, but he understands that theories matter only, if they, only with respect to the relation of the real world. And so around December he says, hey, I need you to break my model. He actually was getting it uh, going fairly well. We had a bit of a cultural problem there. I said, okay, sure, uh, which to American means, yes, I'm going to do it. To French means, yeah, whatever. <laughs> um, and so for the rest of the call, I said, yes, I will, in more and more emphatic terms, and I realized finally the only thing I could do was just immediately after the call send him that something that broke his model, which... I could at that point, um, although it involves six processes. Anyway, uh, by the time we got to that point, it was getting kind of tough. Uh, that was the last time I was able to just look at his model and generate a, uh, a counterexample. Uh, so I started writing scripts to automatically generate them. Uh, and I, well, apparently I had 2,700 of these things uh, to go with the 348 manual test that Jod uh, had me look at in summer 2015. Uh, and Luke, uh, not to be outdone, did 800 or more uh, using a tool he has. And the thing is, the really cool thing about working with Luke is he realizes that validation is just as important in theory as it is in practice, and that's been very helpful. But of course, that's great. Um, you know, we've got this thing that matches my intuition of what RCU does, but uh, there's this stuff called real hardware, and some of the hardware has performer models, and uh, you know, so on. And the thing is that there's always going to be some uncertainty. Uh, some of the hardware is not documented very well, and uh, use cases come and go, and so we, uh, we have a stronger and a weaker model as a result. But uh, the other question uh, is, uh, who's going to run all these tests? I have a day job. Luke does as well. He's a professor as, as well. But uh, before we get there, Luke preferred, actually produced the first high-quality memory model that included the realistic RCU, and I think that deserves a round of applause. <laughs> so Luke recruited this guy, Andrea Perry, who's at the Real-Time Systems Laboratory in Scuola Superiore Santana uh, in Pisa, Italy. Um, he's a PhD student, and he did a bunch of stuff. He did some scripts to convert uh, the litmus test to Linux kernel modules. So you can take a litmus test, run it through this script, get a kernel module which you can then load and run in the kernel and see what if the kernel memory model does to that litmus test what the real hardware and the real kernel do. He also, uh, up to this point, we were doing weird stuff like R1, R of once, R1x, the Lisa code, and he added the support for something that gives you the actual syntax of the, C, of the Linux kernel. Uh, and then we use Luke's, Luke's infrastructure to summarize results on the web, and that's uh, really helpful because, uh, um, you know, uh, 
uh, it's, uh, we've got thousands of these things, right? Now, the thing is, the results were looking pretty good in early 2016, but the problem is, is that I'm a Linux kernel hacker. Luke is a memory model theoretician. Andrea Perry is a PhD student, all right? And there isn't a whole lot of overlap between our specialties, which means it's really, really easy for us to be using the same words and meaning something entirely different. And if we do that, we've got a bug in the memory model. So we need some kind of a bridge between these specialties to make, make that work. Uh, but before we get to that, uh, I think Andrea deserves a round of applause because, boy, those litmus tests are a lot easier right now than we're going to get funny things. And he did a lot of work to get from those litmus tests to Linux kernel modules. So I recruited this guy. He's a guy named Alan Stern. He's at the Rolling Institute of, at uh, Harvard. He's a staffer, keeps the machines running. And uh, uh, if you know of him, you've probably heard he's a maintainer of Linux kernel drivers, three of them. Um, but he's done a few other things. He has degrees in, in uh, mathematical logic, which is one of the reasons I thought he'd be helpful here. And uh, he's got a huge list of publications. Uh, I've provided three of them. Two just to be there, and the last one is actually relevant. Uh, he, he and another guy wrote a book on uh, nuclear magnetic resonance data processing in 96. Uh, this, this other one, I don't know what to do with it, decided to just read the title. De novo backbone and sequence design of an idealized alpha beta barrel protein, evidence of stable tertiary structure. <laughs> but the one that uh, matters, he was a co-author on the paper that several of us wrote, uh, user level implementations of read copy update, and he was the guy that generated the informal semantics and also an informal proof of correctness of user space RCO. So I figured he might be able to provide the bridge between the Linux kernel hacker and the theoreticians. And what I hoped is that he'd critique the model. We had this model, I hope you go through it and you know, this is right, this is wrong. Um, and he actually did that by rewriting it from scratch. <laughs> um, he also produced uh, very accurate models of RCU. I'm not gonna go through this line by line. Um, this is half of it. This does the read side critical section. Remember, read side critical section, you start with RC read lock, you have a bunch of stuff, you have RC read unlock. Um, they can be nested, and you can have several in a process, and those can be nested as well. And so, uh, um, having uh, something that's essentially an axiom, uh, an axiom engine deal with that is a bit challenging, and there it is. Um, uh, one thing I'll call attention to this uh, let match, let, and it's let recursive, and it's got one, two, three, four, five, six set functions. It's got six mutually recursive set functions to get the thing going. This is an excellent example of the uh, coding style that these guys use. I call it mutually assured recursion. <laughs> <laughs> they don't like my coding style very well either. And on the update side, we have this. Uh, this first line uh, interfaces the RCU chunk to the rest of the memory model, and the rest of it implements the, uh, uh, the counting thing I talked about earlier, where if it finds a path, it just counts the number of grace periods in our research critical sections, and if there are more grace periods, at least as many grace periods, it says, can't happen. So this thing handles uh, arbitrary Nesting. I mean, I would have been happy if the thing just required, just allowed only a single RC preset critical session per process that encompassed all our entire process. That would have been enough to be useful, but uh, that wasn't good enough for him. He did the full race. And it interfaces the rest of the memory model. You can change the memory model and it'll, it'll reflect in it. And this whole thing is 24 lines of code. I think that deserves a round of applause. <laughs> Okay, um, so this is a small example of cat language. Um, I'm gonna go through this kind of fast, we don't have a huge amount of time. Uh, the, this is three lines. The full model is on the order of 200 lines, all right? But this just kind of gives you a flavor of how this works. And uh, each of these things represents a set. So the variables are sets of, and uh, sets of relations. So um, RF is reads from, and we'll go through a little bit on what these things are. Basically what that does is if you have a write and you have something that reads from it, there is a relation with that write and that read in that set. Uh, so that was the most straightforward. CO uh, is for writes to the same variable. If you have a write to a given variable and a later write to that same variable, later being that the later guy overwrote this value or overwrote a later value, then those two writes are in the CO set. So it's kind of the coherence order or the modification order, would be the way the C11 guys would say it, of these various variables. 
And from read is the weirdest one. Uh, it took me some time to get my head around this. It's uh, not quite backwards of reads from, but it's sort of. From reads lengths from any read to any later write to the same variable that came too late to affect the value read. All right? So if you do a read and it's going to read some write, or maybe the initial value, and then there's some other write that shows up later in coherence order than whatever the heck it read from, all those later writes will, will be paired with that read and from read. And it's actually not a, a primitive thing. You can express it in terms of RF and seal like that if you want to. Um, flip the order of the reads from and then all the seals after that. <coughs> the lock is a little more straightforward. It's uh, just if you have uh, in the same thread, you have accesses to a given variable. The early accesses and the later accesses, each, each early access and each later access will be in a relation in this set. And then COM is the union of those three things up there. Union is just a vertical bar. And then uh, what this, and so this, what we've done is we define COM to be the union of these three guys. We define coherence order to be the union of those two guys. And then we assert that coherence order must be acyclic. Okay? And so what that's doing is it's giving a single variable SC. In other words, everybody agrees on the order of rights aligned, <coughs> same size rights to a given variable. Okay, so that was kind of brutal. Let's take a look at an example. So here we have a pair of rights and a pair of reads, and there's only one variable x, and so this rule should apply. And uh, the outcome we're looking for is R1 getting the, the 4 and R2 getting the 3. And that may seem kind of strange, but uh, you know, suspend this belief for a little bit and let's just apply the, the rule to it. So can somebody tell me where the RF links go? Remember, RF pairs a write with a read that read that value. And we're worried, I mean, there's a bunch of ways this can happen. We've got a specific execution that results in R1 equaling 4 and R2 equaling 3. The other execution we don't care about. So can somebody tell me where the reads from links go? Which writes pair with which of the reads? First write with the second read and vice versa? Very good. The first write, there's an RF from the first write to the second read. There's an RF from the second write to the first read. Yeah. And let's let's draw them in. Like that. Okay, there's your RF links. So the, we have a the RF set has two relations in it, and one relation has the first write and the second read, the other relation has the second write and the first read. Okay. How about um, let's see. Get the order right here. Um, let's let's do two at once because I'm forgetting which ones I did next. Uh, PO lock and CO. Uh, CO remember is a set that has the early writes and the later writes in it uh, to the same variable. And PO uh, links the early accesses to a given variable with later accesses to that same variable. So, um, where where would where would CO go? From I'm sorry. On lettering myself. You might have uttered the right answer. You should. The rights go together and the reads. For CO, it's just the rights. But yeah, you go from the first right to the second right because they happen in order. So yeah, with CO goes going to go on the left hand side from the right to the other. Uh, how about PO lock? And that is any access within the same thread to the same variable. Right hand side, right hand side. Yeah, okay, so one each on each side. Okay, so uh, it turns out I did PO lock first, and there's CO. Um, and there they are. Okay, uh, now for the fun one FR, from read. Um, so uh, from read, again, is from a read to a write that came too late to affect the value read. So uh, this is kind of a, we'll, we'll, give you, we'll give you a little bit of time uh, to work out what FR would be. So again, it's from a read to the right that came too late to affect the value read. Would it be directly across, so like from R1 yeah. to right ones, and then from R2 to the right Okay, four? so let's see what we got here. So um, this one, uh, from this one to this guy, you mean? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, 
So if we do that though, uh, this guy read a later value, so this is actually earlier. But let's take a look at your second suggestion, which is from this guy to this guy. Is that it? Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, so um, in that case, uh, what's happening is that um, this guy, this guy actually read this value, and then this one came later. So yes, from here to here is in fact an element of FR. This top one is not, but the bottom one is. And let's draw that in. And there it is. And uh, anybody notice something about the arrows once we've added that one in? <laughs> I, I lost the back one, but it sounded like I got a good reaction, so good show. There's a cycle, exactly. There's a cycle, exactly. And let's, let's emphasize the cycle. In pink there, you see there's a cycle. And remember, what we said, what the code said, is if you have a cycle in those relations, the execution is forbidden. So those of you that felt uncomfortable about this, you're exactly right to feel uncomfortable. It's a forbidden execution, all right? <laughs> So, so there you are. And uh, not, not all communication, uh, let's see, so I'm going to, um, we'll take a look at this. The thing is that uh, RF is a nice one. It's kind of more intuitive, and it also has a good relation with time as long as you aren't doing speculation. Uh, if you're doing speculation optimizations, uh, you know, why can you do hard? The thing is, somebody to write, and then that value had to be communicated somewhere, and somebody read it. And the thing is, the problem, the problem that people have, the thing you have to be careful of, is that is two facts about computer systems. One is that the speed of light is finite, even in a computer. And the second one <coughs> is that computers are non-zero size. Okay? And that means that it takes time for a value to propagate from one part of the computer to the other. And so what that means is unless somebody is speculating, and if they are, they're supposed to account for that, but let's ignore speculation. You can do speculation as long as you quash it when something bad happens, okay? And if you, that means that if you make the speculation visible to the user, you have quashed the bad case and you only see the good ones. And what that means, if you read something somebody wrote, you know the read happened later in time, in real time, than the right did. And that turns out to provide you some ordering that is helpful in design of algorithms. If you, if you make use of reads, reads reading writ, things written, you can use weaker, less expensive synchronization. A CO can go backwards in time. And the reason is, is that if you have a really big parallel machine, there's writes happening all over the place, and they don't want to kind of stop the whole machine to figure out which write happened first. So the writes kind of propagate through, and when two values crash, they decide which one won. And that happened here. This write actually happened after this write, but when the two values collided and decided to take the earlier one. And therefore, CO goes backwards in time. Now, what's really happening is, uh, is that we're having, it's not like things are going backwards in time. It's a sort of artifact of propagation delay through the machine. But still, uh, with an RF relation, you know that the, read, the, the right happened before the read. With CO, you don't know the rights happen in any particular order. And let's show how that can happen. Okay, so we start off, we've got CPU 0 and 3 are, are doing the uh, writes, and the variable written to happens to be in the cache of CPU 0 over there. All right, so uh, CPU 3 does this write first. It puts the value in the store buffer. Well, that's fine, uh, but it doesn't have the cache line. So it sends a request out saying, give me the cache line, I need to write this thing. And that propagates through at this, about that time later, CPU 0 does its write, except that it's got the cache line right there. And so it puts the write in the cache line. And meanwhile, the request from CPU 3, which it is write first, is still propagating. And then it gets the cache line, removes it from CPU 0, because it want to have one copy of the cache line so that every sees consistent values, uh, at least over time. It comes back, and then it does the write. Okay, it, it doesn't do the, excuse me, it, it grabs the cache line, and then after it's got the cache line, now it can actually apply it. And that means the write that happened earlier in time ended up <coughs> persisting, ended up being the later write in terms of CO. All right, that's just the way the machines are built. You can make them not do that, it's just 
expensive. Okay, and F, uh, so what's happening is if you think about it that way, CL is actually going forward in time. The rights are being applied to the cash line in time order. It's just that there's no predictable relation between when the CPU did the write and the write is the cash line. So the things are still happening temporally. It's real hardware. It's just that the software can't see that. And so if you're looking in terms of the software, you have to accept that CO says nothing about the order of the rights. Okay. Um, and so we have it backwards in time. FR, I'm not going to go through this in detail, but you have exactly the same thing again. Uh, the write takes time to propagate, so read could happen later than the write, but not late enough that the write made it to that CPU. And therefore, when you have a from read relationship, it doesn't necessarily indicate a time relationship. And uh, we can, I'm not going to go through this in detail, but you can see that that happens there. So the moral of the story is the more read from links you have in your algorithm, the lighter weight barriers you can use and the faster your algorithm will run. is isn't always possible to make that work, but if you can, that's helpful. So, um, uh, we're right at the end of time. Um, this just says, basically set, goes through, I'll, I'll have the slides posted, but just goes through basically as you add more and more of the CO and RF relations, you have to use heavier and heavier weight synchronization in order to make things come out in the order you expect them to. Uh, this slide, I'm not going to go through in detail, but it'll be there. You can add, right now, if you want to, you can download these models and run them. Um, the stuff's freely available. Uh, you have to get OCaml, which is a little bit strange, but then that's what they like using, so that's what we have. Um, and uh, there are litmus tests available as well. Uh, the model, the language can currently do, this is things it currently can do. Um, and we have tri spin lock and spin lock prototypes, spin lock prototypes. Basically, just implement in terms of exchange. We're currently, uh, this Friday, we had our, our weekly call and we had a big argument about how you do locking in a platonic axiomatic sense. And it turns out that things like uh, spin is locked and spin unlock weight and the Linux kernel make it really, really hard. Okay. But we'll figure something out. And uh, we mentioned limitations earlier. Uh, this is a, a bunch of limitations. We don't model compiler optimizations, we don't have arithmetic particularly. Um, but even with these, you can still take your core of your synchronization algorithm and feed it to it and say, can the bad thing happen or not, and have it tell you. So we've automated much of memory barriers.txt. Mel Gorman posted an LWN a few years ago saying that memory barriers.txt could be used to scare children. Um, of course, that's really labor intensive. You have to read it to all of them. And we decided <laughs> to automate this process. Uh, this is, as far as I know, this is the first realistic formal uh, Linux kernel memory model, and the, as far as I know, the first memory model of any kind containing RCU, and we hope, as I said before, that it'll help with education, with uh, design aid, uh, porting, and, uh, and uh, hopefully it'll get into additional tooling as well. And uh, we've actually had a number of people asking for it, um, and uh, I was one, uh, I don't know, how many people have heard of a guy named Al Biro? Uh, he was asking for it last summer and was surprised that we had it a prototype already, so sometimes you get lucky. I'm not going to go through this in detail, but if you want more information on Probe Deter, I'd be in legal sponsor of that slide, and if there's more questions, we can take them. Yeah? So, <coughs> sorry. is the purpose of this for somebody starting to uh, write a new module to make sure that they are following the rules right and have confidence that they have the right sort of memory barriers? Or is it to find bugs in existing code? Or how, how, will, how would these tools be used in practice? Uh, those are two use cases. Um, the first one, what I expect we'll end up doing, people have asked for it, is we'll, is we'll have a, a shorter document that says, here are some things you can do. Here are use cases that work, just in, as text. But the guys that want it, they look at that and go, this isn't quite what I want. I want to try this other thing. They can just do that other thing, put it in the model, and see what happens. So that's kind of like the first one. Um, the second one, we have actually used some of the hardware models to uh, find bugs in Linux kernel. Somebody says, I'm, you know, this is, looks broken. Okay, let's take those accesses, put them in. Yes, indeed, the hardware can actually do that bad thing. And so I expect we'll have similar things here. But yeah, it's, uh, uh, hopefully we'll get multiple different types of uses. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see how it goes. We expect to have a session in September at uh, Linux Plumbers Conference in LA uh, where the, uh, uh, if it gets accepted. It's right now it's a proposal. What we're going to try to do is get a bunch of people in a room and, and have them all install the thing and, and run through using it. So, 
Yeah. Yeah. Um, how much of it is uh, platform specific versus just the uh, uh, powering model? Okay, so uh, let, me, let me say something different and see if it's what, what you're asking, make sure I understand the question. Um, this is something that is, uh, is generic, um, and it's, it, it's, it's not tied to any given platform, yet we have the other tools that are tied. There's one that's tied to ARM, another tied to PowerPC, another one x86. Um, why would I use one or the other, right? And uh, you'd use this one for core, core kernel code that runs the same on all the platforms, like RCU, like my stuff. Uh, you just use the other ones. For example, if you're writing Power, power PC specific code, why not use the PowerPC model? You can get away with more there because you know, the, you know this code's running on this particular hardware. So if this particular hardware allows something and some other hardware doesn't, no problem, you can do that. That makes sense? And the other thing we do, uh, this is what Andrea's thing is, is we actually take the generic model and compare it to the, to the hardware specific models to make, if, in other words, if our model says something can happen and the hardware model says it can't, that's okay, right? Sort of okay. Linus yells at us beyond a certain point, but at some point it's okay. If our model says it can't happen, and some piece of hardware allows it, that's really bad. And so we use the formal models as a comparison thing. Okay. That's a good question. Yeah. As much as I love Linux, I realize there are other kernels mm -hmm. out there for operating systems, and some of them I've heard might even be proprietary. <laughs> are, do you know Fair of thought. other kernel developing systems out there that are embracing these tools or these strategies? Uh, there are um, not a kernel so much, but some proprietary applications that are uh, looking to the C11 memory model. Um, although there are some limitations there, and they, and so far they have exceptions to it. But the C11 plus this, right? Um, most of the older applications were developed long before there was anything resembling a formal memory model. <laughs> it's sort of like the Linux kernel, so it's uh, uh, hopefully some of them will come on board. I have advised several different groups that you really need to get something like this. But, yeah, you know, uh, one of the advantages the Linux kernel has is it has a huge number of developers and users. And so we got, you know, five people here that put in a good chunk of time over two years, and that pays off really quickly. If you have, a, if you have another kernel or application where there's 10 people working on it, that would be a hard decision to make to make that investment, right? So, but maybe they can take this as a starting point. Who knows? That it's, that's the intent to allow that, so. Other questions? Actually, I think it's about time that I get out of the way of the next guy presenting. Thank you very much. And have a great rest of the